Um, these past couple weeks, we have been in our series. Our series was, does anybody remember what it was called? Oh, oh, I heard it. Rooted, rooted in Christ, yes. So we've been looking at how when we plant deep roots in Jesus. Oh, wait a second. While you pass out your. Okay, these past couple weeks, we've been looking at rooted. And we've looked at how when we root ourselves in Jesus, we have seen how there can be joy that comes out of that, how there can be, um, yeah, true joy that doesn't fail. And last week, we looked at different fruits of the Spirit with Sam. And um, even though we've talked a lot about rooting ourselves in Christ, I know that there can still be a lot of hard things out there that you guys deal with, a lot of struggles, uh, specifically a lot of mental health struggles. And you're like, why am I rooting my life in Christ and this is still happening? Well, we... We see that, we understand that, we feel that. And so with that and because of just everything that's been going on this month, we wanted to bring in a licensed mental health professional from our area. Her name is Jill Thomas. Jill, yeah, woo! Yeah, you guys can give her a welcome. So Jill um, is a counselor here in the area and she's actually a member of Keystone and she loves the Lord deeply. And so we are super excited to have her here with us today. She's going to be talking to us about uh, mainly anxiety and depression. And honestly, guys, just to lay my cards out on the table, we're going to be here for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we're not going to connection groups. But actually, we're going to take a couple minute break to get up, get our wiggles out, and then we're going to come back here, and Jill is going to answer some of the questions that you guys wrote down last week and the week before. So we are super excited about that. And since you guys will have a break in like 20, 25 minutes, I really want you guys to lean in and take in what Jill has to say because this is real stuff that applies to everybody's life, whether it's your own or whether it's your friends. This is stuff that we need to know. So we're really thankful for Jill to be here. Why don't you guys give her another warm welcome? Thanks. You guys have such good energy. I feel kind of bad, like, dropping the vibe down to something really serious. But um, it'll be good. And if we can get some laughs squeezed in there throughout this talk, that's even better. Um, But like she said, I'm a licensed mental health counselor. I love working with teenagers. Not all therapists work with teenagers, but I do, and I love it. Um, And you guys go through a lot of hard things, and you have a lot of big feelings, and you have a lot of stressors, and um, a lot of things pulling at you, and you're in an interesting season of life, and so I like getting to journey with um, kids and teens through what they're going through. So I would love to answer your questions at the end, and I will do my best to just keep this talk as short as possible so that we can answer questions. Um, What I'm going to try to focus on today is just the stress you're under and the anxiety that you or your loved ones might be feeling. Um, I wanna talk about why we have feelings like that. Um, Why do certain people respond differently to stress and anxiety than others? What affects that? Uh, What hope does God give us? Um, And then some practical tools that we can use to kind of root ourselves in Christ like you've been learning about. How do I do that day to day? Um, So let's talk about Feeling. So feeling anxious. To feel anxious or to feel sad or to feel worried are all normal feelings that are just a part of being human. So I think that's something to understand because a lot of the middle schoolers that I work with want to avoid any negative or unpleasant feeling they might ever have. And that's not real life. Um, At least that's not the world we're living in. And so I think it's important to understand that we have feelings for a reason. Um, And when you feel anxious or stressed, sometimes that can be a good thing. Like I spoke at a conference recently in front of hundreds of people and you bet I felt really anxious before I went on stage. My stomach was churning, my heart was pounding. Okay, that's not a fun feeling. I don't like the way that feels. But what it did was it motivated me to focus in, be prepared, pray before I went on stage, and take that task really seriously. And so sometimes we have stress and anxiety because it helps us perform. You might feel stress before a big game or before you perform on stage for, you know, choir or something. So 
If you have a test tomorrow, it's good to feel a little anxious about that because it's probably gonna motivate you to study. So I don't want you to think that anytime you feel stress or anxiousness or worry that something's wrong with you, okay? Most people feel those things, but those feelings kind of come and go, and that's good. The problem comes in when those feelings don't just come and go very easily. Like as soon as I went up on stage and started talking, all that anxiety kind of alleviated and I was fine. But if I had like an anxiety disorder, there's no way I would have gotten up on stage. I would have had a panic attack. So I think that when we have feelings that persist and they get worse and I try to do things to feel better and I don't and I start having different symptoms, that's when we have to start, okay, pay attention. Like something is not right here. Um, So just like if you had a cough and a fever or a cold or something, you would try to treat it at home and you would start to feel better after a week or so. But if you didn't and you had this persistent, persistent cough or your fever got higher or you had shortness of breath, do you know what your parents would do? They would take you into the doctor or take you to the hospital because at that point, things have gotten worse and you need help or treatment to get better. And so that's what I do. When people come into counseling, it's because things have gotten to that point where they're not okay and they need some help to get to feeling better. So for stress and anxiety, what that might look like is like worrying a lot most days of the week about things that maybe other kids aren't that fixated on or worried about. It might mean getting easily overwhelmed, really easily stressed, um, losing sleep, not being able to fall asleep at night or stay asleep. Uh, stomach aches, headaches, um, being really, really hard on yourself or really, really hard on the people around you, having really high expectations and being really rigid about those expectations. And when they're not met, you feel pretty awful about it. Um, Sometimes anxiety in middle schoolers looks like irritability (laughs) and just being kind of grumpy most of the time. Um, Sometimes that can just be hormones. Sometimes that can be anxiety though, or stress that you're going through. So those are things to pay attention to for you or your friends who might be struggling. Okay, so I mentioned that emotions aren't all bad, okay? We have ones that we really like. Like I saw some of you feeling emotions out there, like excitement to see somebody and you ran and jumped on them. Like those are fun feelings, we like those. Um, But God is an emotional being and we are made in God's image. And so if he's an emotional being, that means we have an array of emotions. And they're important because emotions help connect us to each other. Emotions help signal things to us. So if you want, you could think about emotions kind of being like the road signs on the road. They're not like steering the car, but you need to pay attention to the signs because they're signaling things to you, things that would be good for you to know. Um, An example might be like if you feel lonely, that's a signal, that's a road sign that you might need to connect with somebody, FaceTime a friend, go and hang with your sister, reach out. If you're feeling sad when you hear what somebody's going through, that sadness that you feel might motivate you to hug that person or to be there for them or to spend time with them to help cheer them up. If you feel the emotion of fear, Sometimes that's not good, and then you might have an anxiety disorder, but sometimes fear can be really good. Like, I feel a little bit of fear and anxiety when I'm driving on an icy road. And God is giving me that emotion because God wants me to slow down and be cautious. He, he wants me to pay attention to my surroundings, and he's using emotions to help me pay attention to that. So, if emotions can be good, even if they feel kind of uncomfortable, Where's the problem? Well, the problem is, is when the fall happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and sin entered the world, all of a sudden something that God made for good now can be used for bad. So now that we have sin in the world and we're broken people in a broken world, we can have suffering, we can have mental illness, depression, anxiety, suicide, different diseases, global pandemics, all kinds of things that wouldn't happen in God's original creation, okay? So sin messed that up. Not necessarily your sin or your sin, but sin in general. And so that's what we're dealing with now. 
So it's not necessarily your fault when you're struggling with something like this. It's, the, it's just our reality. Just like I could get sick and my body is not working like it's supposed to. My mind cannot work like it's supposed to too. So that's why it's so important that you guys be in the word and you start to learn what God says and what truth is because the literal definition of a mental health issue is when our thinking gets twisted and distorted and we don't see things clearly. But if you are knowing God's word and you know what scripture says, you're gonna have this constant truth to compare your thoughts and feelings to as a way to measure like, is this really reliable, what I'm feeling right now, or is it a lie? So that's one thing I want you guys to take away from tonight. If you don't pay attention to the rest of the talk at all, please write this down or circle it on your little handout that emotions are real, but they're not always reliable. So when you're angry, when you're frustrated with somebody, when you are nervous, when you're feeling down, like your feelings are valid and you, have, you can let yourself feel that way. But you always have to question, is this emotion pointing me to truth or is this pointing me to a lie? Because just because I feel rejected doesn't mean that I actually don't have any friends and nobody likes me. Does that make sense? Just because I feel like a failure because of what just happened on the field out there doesn't mean I'm actually a failure, failure and I shouldn't be playing the sport. So sometimes our feelings can mislead us and we need to pay attention to that. Okay, so sometimes people ask me like, okay, well, how come I go through the same experiences as other people, but I respond to it really differently? I'm struggling with depression or I'm struggling with anxiety and my friend isn't. Like, what's up with that? So there's a lot of things that affect how you're gonna respond to hard things. One is your body. So there can be physical things in your body that affect how you feel and how you handle anxiety. Things like genetics. Unfortunately, like our parents pass down awesome things and they also can pass down some not awesome things. And that goes with mental health too. It doesn't mean that if somebody in your family has depression or anxiety, you're automatically gonna struggle with it. It just may mean that you might have a slightly higher risk of it. And that's not something you caused. Sometimes it's our chemicals. We have chemicals in our body that are working all the time to help you function. And when those get off balance, guess what? You can start to feel kind of ucky. Same thing with our hormones. We don't have to talk about hormones. I think you guys get that, but it affects all of that. Sometimes it's not your body. Sometimes it's your social circle. So there's a saying that you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And people say that because it's kind of true. Like the people that you surround yourself with and spend the most time with, whether you like it or not, have a direct influence on how you think, how you feel, what you think is cool, how you act, maybe how you dress. And so we want to pay close attention to like, who is in my social circle? Is that helping me or is that hurting me? Other things that can affect us is our culture. So you guys are growing up in a very different culture than even I did, and I'm not that old. So when I was in middle school, the only people I could compare myself to were the girls sitting next to me in class. And they were just regular girls like me. So it wasn't like the standards were that high. You guys can compare yourself with the digital age with cell phones. You can literally compare yourself to athletes, movie stars, celebrities, someone that lives halfway around the world. You're constantly getting fed this unrealistic standard of what you should be, but you're not. And so you guys are growing up in a, in a culture that sends a ton of toxic messages to teenagers that you're not enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're not cool enough. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough friends. You don't get enough likes. You don't get enough DMs. A direct message. It's like when people message you on your phone. Don't worry about it. You don't need it. That's the point. <laughs> The pressure on you guys is something unreal compared to what I had. So when I was your age, people weren't struggling with anxiety disorders at the rate that they are now. Suicide was not even on my radar when I was your age. I don't even know if I could really accurately tell you what it was. 
So that just goes to show how drastically things have changed because of our culture, which again is not our fault and we can't control the culture we're living in, but we absolutely can control how we interact with that culture. Are we getting sucked and pulled into it or are we kind of resist, resisting and kind of starting our own track in something a little healthier? So there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise for you guys and that affects it. The last thing that affects your level of stress and anxiety are your experiences. So obviously, I hope this isn't the case for you, but it was the case for me. If you've been through any sort of trauma or abuse in childhood, that's absolutely gonna affect your brain and your body. That's absolutely gonna make it more likely for you to be in a fragile place where you're gonna struggle with some depression or anxiety. Um, if you've experienced bullying, or maybe you haven't even really been bullied, but you just have a group of friends where the way that they talk to you is to make fun of you or to tease you. There's nothing really like positive and uplifting happening there. It's just a lot of insults kind of being passed back and forth. That's gonna weigh on you. Peer pressure, grief, loss, losing loved ones. Maybe it's your family dynamics. You know, that's the people that you spend so much time with, the people that you care about the most. If things are messed up in your family, if things aren't going well, that's gonna affect you. That's gonna put stress and anxiety on you. Um, and then your spiritual health. So obviously if you're not, if you, if you don't have Christ in you and you aren't taking steps to walk with the Lord, your soul is just gonna be constantly looking for something to fill the void. And it's never gonna feel like enough. And so that's gonna leave you pretty unsatisfied and pretty unhappy. So there's spiritual health coming into play. The goal of me telling you all of this is that a lot of times when I see clients, they think it's their fault that they're in that office. And more often than not, they didn't cause any of the things that they're struggling with. They are responsible for dealing with it and coping with it and learning from it and getting help but they weren't the ones that caused the suffering in the first place. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's all really heavy. Where is the hope in this message? So let's talk about what God promises us. I would love to just talk to you guys about God's promises and how good and faithful he is and tell you story after story of just his faithfulness in my life. Like if you guys knew what my childhood was like, you would your jaws would drop at me standing here in front of you today being the person that I am. And it's only because of God. So I would just spend hours talking to you about that, but I don't, I have like two minutes. So um, if you wanna talk more with me afterwards, I'm gonna hang out. Um, but the promises of God that I want you to walk away with today are three that I kind of anchor myself in. These are my roots, okay? This is what I plant myself in when I'm struggling. One is you're not alone. I'm with you, I care. That's what God says in his word. Deuteronomy 31, six says, he goes before you, never leaves you nor forsakes you. He gives us the Holy Spirit when we accept Christ and that Holy Spirit acts as a helper, an encourager, a comforter. John 16, 33 says, I have said these things to you, this is Jesus talking, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, which means have courage, I have overcome the world. Jesus says that. He doesn't say, in me, you will have an easy life. He doesn't say, in me, you will have a ton of pleasure and instant gratification. No, it's gonna be hard, but he says, in me, you will have peace. And I'm telling you guys, I've walked with the Lord enough years to know what it's like to truly be suffering and still have God's peace. And it breaks my heart that there are people who are suffering who don't know Jesus and they don't have that. Their hope is in nothing. So that promise that God gives us that we're not alone and he's with us is crucial. Second one is, God says, I will work all things for your good. I am sovereign and I am trustworthy. I think of Romans 8, 28, some of you know it. God says, I will work all things for your good for those who are called according to my purpose, those who love me and who are called according to my purpose. It doesn't say it's always gonna feel good. It doesn't say it's always gonna be your way and your timing the way you want it to go. 
That's not what he promises us. God sees everything from a bigger picture than our little tunnel vision in what we're going through. And he works all things out for his glory and for his good. And sometimes, sometimes he's gracious enough to even show you the good that came out of that horrible thing you went through. Not always, because we're not entitled to know that. We just trust him with it. But there are times in his kindness that he shows you how he took something broken and awful and hard, and he brought something good out of it. The last one is, I give you everything you need to get through the storms of life. I provide. Satan wants you to think that you're failing, that you're alone, that you should be ashamed, that nobody cares. But this is what Jesus says in John 10.10. The thief, Satan, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come so you may have life and you may have it to the fullest. So Satan comes to steal your joy, kill your hope, destroy your relationships, and he's really good at it. And the way that he does that is planting lies. Just enough lies to make you doubt God's truth, doubt God's goodness, doubt yourself, not like yourself very much. And then Satan's planting those seeds so that you could be surrounded by good things that God's provided for you and you could be gifted all these things as an amazing person and you don't believe any of it. But Jesus says, I have come so you will have life abundantly, hope, joy, freedom in Christ. But if Satan can't defeat you, he's gonna discourage you. I was really encouraged before I came up here tonight and you guys sang those worship songs. I just stood in the back and I watched you guys all come up here and sing out to the Lord. And I know that you guys are going through hard stuff. Not everybody in here has like a Brady Bunch life right now. There's a lot of hard things that you're going through, but I'm telling you, when you can look up to the Lord and you can raise your voice to him and praise him in the storm that you're going through and the things that you're dealing with, that is like a slap in the face to Satan. Because what you're saying is, is I trust God no matter what. No matter what I'm going through, Satan's not gonna discourage me. He's not gonna lie to me. Not today, Satan. I'm gonna raise my hands to the Lord. Okay, so what are some tools you guys can use when you're going through hard things or your friends are going through hard things? One of the main things I encourage people to do is use prayer. It can feel weird. You might not feel like you're very good at it. That's okay. God's gonna meet you where you're at. But a really easy one to start with is called a breath prayer. And this is just a really easy way to connect you with God when you're stressed out or when things are just over your head, you feel like you're drowning in it. A breath prayer is simply inhaling through your nose. You can try it. Exhaling through your mouth. You guys are really good at that. As you're inhaling through your nose, you're praying something that you're gonna ask God for. Maybe just one word. And then when you exhale, you're giving God something. You're surrendering something over to him. Again, just one word. So here's an example. I'm gonna do a breath prayer and I'm gonna inhale faith and I'm gonna exhale fear. Or I'm gonna do a breath prayer and I'm going to um, inhale peace and exhale anger. And you do it over and over and over and literally visualize God giving you the peace and you giving up the anger. Another one you can do is the serenity prayer. And I added it onto your handout, but it's teeny tiny, So you might have to hold it up really close to your face. This is not straight from the Bible. Um, It's not actual scripture, but I love it because it has so many coping skills packed into it. So if you memorize the serenity prayer, I guarantee you it's going to come in handy. The serenity prayer helps you focus on what you can control, what you can't control. It helps you be in the moment Because when we're not in the moment, life can just seem overwhelming. It reminds us that Jesus already paid the price for all the things that we're struggling with or all the things that are hard. He's already conquered all of it. He's gonna equip us for it. Another thing we can do besides prayer is something called mindfulness. Raise your hand if you've heard of mindfulness. 
Okay. Somebody shout out. What do you think mindfulness means? Wait, say it louder. Caring? Okay, I like that. Mindfulness is kind of a trendy word right now, but really all that it means is being able to be fully present in this moment without judging it. And we're not very good at that. So if I'm practicing mindfulness, I'm just stating the facts. I'm not getting judgy. So me being mindful right now is like, hey, I'm standing in front of the youth group and I'm giving a talk. I'm not thinking about what I had for dinner before I came. I'm not worried about how much sleep I'm gonna get tonight. I'm just fully present here with you. And what mindfulness does is it pauses our crazy brains and all those emotions swirling and it helps us just take on this moment, which is totally manageable. It's when we start to take on other things that we get tripped up. Okay, Jill, so how do I do mindfulness? There's a million ways to do mindfulness. There's apps out there. I put some of those on the sheet. I'm gonna teach you some easy ones. Anytime you use your five senses, it helps to ground you in the current moment, okay? Your five senses can only pick up what's right here, right now. What I see, what I hear, what I feel, all of that. Okay, so five, four, three, two, one is that pause button for your brain. You're gonna do five things you see, four things you feel, three things you hear, two things you smell, and one thing you taste. So here's what it looks like. If I'm gonna do five, four, three, two, one, because I'm stressing out, I might say, I see a white hat, I see a chair, I see pink shoes, I see a camera, I see a sucker in the air. Okay, what are four things that I feel? And this can be things on the inside or on the outside of your body. I feel the shoes on my feet, I feel the microphone on my face, I feel my stomach's kind of tight, and I feel kind of tired. Okay, what are three things that I hear? I hear papers rustling. I hear the sound of my voice. I hear someone clapping. Two things I smell. I smell my hand lotion, my hair, and then one thing I taste. I just taste like my leftover dinner kind of hanging out in my mouth. Okay, that didn't take very long. That just took like one minute. So it's not a big thing. But what it did was in that time I was doing five, four, three, two, one, I couldn't be anywhere else. I couldn't be worried about what that girl thinks about me or I couldn't be stressing about whether or not I'm gonna be invited to that party or I'm not thinking about what's gonna happen when I get home. I'm just right here. So what it does is it trains your brain like a muscle on how to discipline yourself to just be present. Whether it's a good moment or a hard moment, when you're just in that moment, you can deal with it. Okay, another way to do mindfulness is, you've probably heard in scripture, take every thought captive. What does it mean to think about what I'm thinking about? Yeah, kind of. So another thing we can do with mindfulness is be aware of our robot thoughts versus what I call noodle thoughts. And I use this in therapy all the time. So you're getting a little free session here. I know. Um, Okay, so your robot thoughts are gonna be those negative automatic thoughts that we all have whizzing in our brain every day. And I say they're robot thoughts because they're really rigid and they kind of are like, you know, nobody likes me. I can't figure this out. I'm such a loser. They're just like, wah, wah. You all have them. I know you have robot thoughts. Okay. So mindfulness is thinking about what you're thinking about. Is what I'm thinking about right now really truth? Like, are you going to say that God says that? Are you going to say that to your best friend? Because if it's not true in Scripture and it's not true of them, it's not true of you either. So those are robot thoughts. Okay, well, let's say I catch the robot thought. I let it go. I don't dwell on it. What do I do then? Okay, you replace it with a noodle thought. You think of a cooked noodle. A cooked noodle is pretty wiggly and flexible. It can bend. It can adjust. It can change shape if it's got pressure on it. So a noodle thought would be something a little more flexible. It would be like, instead of thinking change is bad, change is bad, I don't want another change, school changes so much, I don't want more change, a noodle thought would be like, you know what? Change is just different. 
Sometimes it feels good, sometimes it's hard, but change is just change. That's a noodle thought. And I've gone through changes before and I've gotten through it. That's a noodle thought. Last one is be aware of what you're in control of and what you're not in control of. Sometimes we like to think that we can take on the world and be in control of a lot of things that God is not asking us to try to be in charge of. And I have a slide that shows this. I want you guys to think about this as the three O's of the things you can't control. So, oh, that's kind of fun. That's a different one. But we'll, we'll, oh, you made it better. Did you make it better? Oh my gosh, Will. <clears throat> okay, the three O's are at the very end. No, no, no. The three O's are on the very top. Others, outcomes, and old stuff. Think about the things that you worry about. Think about the things that stress you out. The things that are just kind of swirling in your brain a lot of the times. If it's in one of those three categories, other people, what they're thinking, what they choose to do or not do. If it's outcomes, like what's gonna happen in the future? Like you can't control if you drive home tonight and you get a flat tire. That's a future outcome you can't control. Or old stuff, if it's like what happened at school yesterday or the rumor that was started about me or what my friend did to me, that's old stuff. It's like you don't have control over it because it already happened. It doesn't mean you can't learn from it. It doesn't mean you can't address it. But it just means that you're not allowing those three O's, others, outcomes, and old stuff, to have so much power over you that you're no longer okay. So, okay, if I don't have control over others, outcomes, and old stuff, what is God asking me to do? What am I left with? Well, you're left with your little you bubble in the middle. That's you. That's it. That's all God asks you to deal with is how you manage your feelings, your attitudes, and your behaviors. You can't always control the thoughts and the feelings that hit you, but you absolutely can decide, am I gonna dwell on this and ruminate? Or am I gonna, am I gonna deal with this? Am I gonna cope with this? Am I gonna go to something healthy? Um, a good example would be like if somebody like said something offensive to me, I can't control what they said, and I can't even control that initial feeling I have of being hurt. But I can decide, am I gonna assume the best about that person? that they didn't mean it, you know, they don't normally talk to me like that, or am I gonna assume the worst about them that they hate me and they're just trying to make me look embarrassed in front of everybody? I get to choose that, that's in my bubble. Or whether I choose to not say anything, or if I say something to that person, or if I pull them aside later and I'm like, hey, that wasn't cool, I get to choose that, that's in my bubble. That's all I have to worry about is my little bubble. Okay, the last thing besides prayer, mindfulness is radical acceptance which is a big, fancy therapy way of just saying, fully accepting things as they are, not as you wish they would be. Sometimes all we can think about is how you want things to be different and how you wish this person was different and you wish your life was different and you wish this was going differently. And when that's all we can think about, what happens is we're in denial of what, how things really are and we're pretty miserable. But as soon as we accept things for how they really are or I accept that person, for how they really are, then I can start to cope with it and move through it and God can use it in healthy ways. But if I'm not even accepting it, I'm just like resisting, 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 I end up being miserable and I can't cope. It just gets heavier and heavier and heavier. So a quick way of how to practice radical acceptance, and I hope you guys do this with your small groups, maybe not tonight, but next week or the week after, do it with your leaders, is practice even though I know statements. Even though, fill in the blank with whatever you're feeling or whatever hard thing you're going through, even though my parents are getting a divorce, I know they both love me and we'll figure out a way to get through this. Even though I didn't get invited to that party, I know she's still my friend and she was limited on how many people she can invite. I can hang out with somebody else that night. Even though my brother is super annoying, I know it's not his job to act the way I want him to act all the time. And brothers are annoying. And sisters. The kid in the back was like, uh, hello, sisters too. 
even though they're really annoying, I know I don't have to give my sister that, that much power over me. I don't have to let her put me in a bad attitude or get, make me grumpy. So even though I know statements are helpful for that. Um, real quick, the last thing I wanna talk about for coping skills is gratitude journals. Has anybody ever journaled, keep a journal? Don't tell me where it is. I'm not gonna read it. Don't do it, don't do it your personal journal. A gratitude journal is simple. You're just writing down what, you're, what in your life you are truly grateful for. And it can be small things. It can be, I'm grateful for a roof over my head. Well, that's kind of a big thing. <laughs> That'd be a really big, if you didn't have one. Um, I am grateful that I got to have my favorite lunch at school today. Or I am grateful that, you know, I have a warm bed to sleep in at night. Whatever it is. What gratitude does is it's like the enemy of depression and anxiety. It's really hard to stay depressed and really hard to stay anxious in that moment if you're focusing your mind and your heart and your spirit on what God has done that has already good in your life and acknowledging that instead of getting fixated on all the things that we can't control. Okay, some of you asked, how do you help other people who are struggling? So maybe you're not the one battling this stuff, but you know somebody who is. So for that, I have the three Ps, pray, pursue, and point. So to pray means to pray for that person. God is not asking you to fix it. God is not asking you to take their problems away. But you know who does have control and sovereignty and who cares even more than you about that person? The Lord does. So take those things to the Lord. Pray for that person by name. Pray with them. If you feel comfortable praying with that person, do you know how powerful that is? I can tell you certain times in my life where somebody offered to pray for me and it was a game changer because I felt so alone. But they wrapped their arm around me and they prayed with me. Pursue means check in with that person. Even if you don't, if you don't think, you know, maybe I'm making a big deal out of it, maybe it's not that big of a deal, pursue them. Ask, hey, you seem off lately. You don't seem like yourself. You've been pretty quiet at the lunch table. Hey, I haven't seen you around much lately. Are you doing okay? Follow up with them, empathize with them. Instead of trying to fix it or judging them for the hard thing they're going through, literally try to put yourself in their shoes and just listen. I'm so sorry, that's really hard. I'm really sorry you're going through that. And then last is point. So again, you guys are not the fixers. You guys are, you guys are in the same boat. You're not mental health experts. So it's not on you to make sure other people are okay all the time. We can point them to their connection group leader. We can point them to resources I put on the handout. If they're really struggling and they're not safe, they're cutting or they're talking about suicide, things that are really, really like heavy, you might have to say to your friend, like, I gotta point you to somebody who can help you. Like, we gotta talk to your mom or dad about this. Or we gotta talk to an adult about this. Like, this isn't just gonna go away on its own. And I don't want you suffering with this. I care about you. Point them to somebody who can help because that's not on you to be that for them. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you try some of the, these things that I talked about today and things aren't getting better and you're just tired of feeling the way that you're feeling and you don't wanna stay stuck, then please, please don't hesitate to reach out and talk to somebody about it. That's number one thing. Tell a parent, tell your small group leader, tell Will, tell Jill, tell Bill. I don't care who you tell. Somebody who's a safe, trusted adult, and if they don't help you, go to the next person. And if they don't help you, go to the next person. Like, don't give up. I'm gonna pray real quick. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for just your promises and your truth that we can anchor ourselves in because you know, God, that this world is not easy. And if we're not struggling now, at some point we're gonna hit that valley and we're gonna just be on our knees needing you. And so God, I just pray that in each student that's here tonight, that you would just draw their heart to you and help them to let go of any shame or embarrassment or weird feelings that they're having that are getting in the way of them coming to you with their junk. I thank you for the opportunity to be here and for what you're doing in our lives, God. Amen. All right. Guys, I hope, I know this is a little bit different thing, thing than what we normally do on a Wednesday night, but I hope this has been helpful for you guys because it gives you some super practical tools 
And we had a ton of questions come in, so that's why we're going to fire right to it. Because we to want go. to answer as many as we can. Joe, like, I, we sorted through them. And after, like, the cards that just had smiley, weird faces on them, there were still, like, 70-something really, really good questions that yeah. you got a chance to look through. So I'm really excited about that. Um, here's what we're going to do is we've gone through and we've kind of said, okay, there's a section of these questions that Jill taught, covered a lot of in her talk, um, but then there's some things that you didn't have a chance to get to. Yeah. And so our goal is kind of rapid fire to get to as many as we can in the next, um, in the next 10 minutes or so. And so that's what we're going to be doing. So if you guys can just dial in, I know it's a long time to be in one place, but man, if you can wait on running out and grabbing a drink or headed to the bathroom or whatever, if you can wait for 10 minutes, it'll be worth it. So, um, I know we just kind of jumped right in here rapid fire. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so, Jill, can you tell us just a little bit about your backstory? Like, how did you end up landing in mental health, like in the mental health field? And how did that, how did that all come about? Yeah, so I kind of mentioned in my talk, I had a pretty difficult childhood, we'll say. Um, my dad was an alcoholic and was a mean drunk and was pretty abusive. And so I dealt with just a lot of really scary things and a lot of really hard things at a really young age which definitely like shaped me. Um, and when I hit high school, I remember taking a psychology class and I have never been drawn to something so clearly like I was to learning why do people do what they do? You know, what, what affects how we think and how we feel and, and how we act? Because I couldn't really make sense of what had happened to me. How does this person that's supposed to love me so much be the person that is the cruelest to me, you know? So anyway, long story short is um, God just placed that calling on my heart and it's, I'm, it's never been so clear. It comes so naturally and I am so passionate about it. And I went, I mean, I went to therapy and I fell in love with therapy even more when I did it and I started seeing how God was healing a lot of those wounds in me and how he was using not just counseling, but, but my relationship with him, my heavenly father, was such a healing relationship for me um, and putting people in my life who loved Jesus and could show me my worth and that and how much I mattered and how God viewed me so differently than how I viewed myself. Um, and so anyway, that's how I got into it. Yeah, that's incredible. And I love that God's used your story and kind of redeemed your story. And then now you're able to turn around and then help others write their story as well, which yeah. is really, really fun. So um, talk to us a little bit, if you would, some of the questions that we got, and you touched on a little bit on, like, man, like, there's, there's clinical anxiety and, and like, clinical um, stress, and, like, that's, that's a thing. But then there's also just a, an anxiousness. Um, there's also, like, a little bit of a, a, a not a stigma, but that's a big word, sorry. Um, there's hesitation. It's scary to go, like, hey, I'm going to go to a professional therapist or professional counselor. Like, if you're, like, if you're at that place where you're like, man, I'm 100% confident that this is what I'm supposed to do, but I'm scared or I'm nervous to take mm -hmm. that step, um, what would you say to that person who's on the fence? Oh, I mean, I would say uh, there's a lot of good things that are right around the corner that we miss out on because we're scared. And, and if God is placing that on your heart and you know that, that you don't want to continue going on struggling the way that you are, like he's put counselors here to work through to help us in those pits that we're in. And so I would just say, it's not like it is in the movies. You're not gonna lay down on some couch and just have someone like write things about you. If that happens to you, get up and leave. Go somewhere else. <laughs> That's not what it's supposed to be. Um, you should feel comfortable with your therapist. You should feel like you can trust them. You should, should feel like you can tell them anything. I mean, you have confidentiality, which is a fancy way of saying they can't share with anybody what you share with them. Unless you're threatening to hurt yourself or somebody else, what's said in that room stays in that room, and it's a safe place. And I do play therapy too, so we do sand trays and drawing and art and paint. And so there's a lot of ways to process through what you're going through than just like sitting and staring and talking to somebody. That's, yeah, that's super, super helpful. Um, I love, guys, you guys turned in some incredible questions, by the way. Like, yeah, good job, guys. Props to middle school. Um, I love this question. There's a question here about depression. It says, when I, when I feel, and, and whether that's clinical depression or it's just a deep sadness, but when you feel yourself, like, starting to get pulled in that direction, what are, are there some things that we can do to be proactive 
about going, man, like, I want to be proactive about dealing with those things on the front end instead of waiting until they get overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When you start not feeling like yourself, you're not enjoying the same things you used to, you're starting to feel really sluggish, unmotivated, just kind of blah. Um, That would be, like, a good time to be like, ooh, I kind of need to make some changes. Things we know that are always helpful for when you kind of get into that funk that could lead to depression is sunlight. So that's not very helpful in February, but being outside, vitamin D, moving your body, um, being around people that are kind of, kind of just like let you be where you're at and you don't have to perform for them. Um, You can just be yourself. Um, One thing that we talk about in counseling a lot is opposite action. So if you know that the way that you're feeling, you know, is, is not helpful and you're not able to just like pull up your bootstraps and try harder and get out of it. One thing that's helpful is to do the opposite of what the depression is telling you to do. So if the depression is like, just stay in bed, what's the point of getting out of bed? It's just gonna be the same crappy day as yesterday. The opposite action of that would just to be, okay, I'm just gonna get up and I'm gonna put my clothes on. Okay, now I've got my clothes on, I'm just gonna go brush my teeth. Okay, now I'm, just, now I'm gonna go get my book bag. And you're just like doing the opposite action of what the depression is telling you. If your depression is saying, you know, don't go talk to those people because they're going to think you're a loser. Just isolate, stay by yourself. Then the opposite action would be to go and strike up conversation. You're basically saying, I'm not going to give the depression power over what I do. Because the more power you give it, it's like feeding a beast, the stronger it gets. So if you listen to the depression, you're going to feel worse. So you almost have to like, you know, kind of like will yourself to do the opposite. And if you can't do that, then that's a good time to get into counseling because it's like, you need some of that help and support to be able to fight the depression. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, that's super helpful. Sorry, I got to remember to hold this up. Um, that, I love that. Just basically saying, like, what is what is the natural response? Like, I'm going to go do the opposite. Which, by the way, is that's the, what Scripture tells us all the time about fighting our flesh, guys. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. All the time. So this was a really. I thought this was a really good, really honest question. Um, man, is it? sinful to have or bad or wrong to have thoughts of suicide or to have thoughts of you know fill in the blank with whatever the yeah whatever really the really is. dark thoughts yeah is it is yeah. it automatically sin or what how does that work okay so um suicidal thoughts are kind of lumped into a category we call intrusive thoughts intrusive you think of an intruder like somebody that's unwanted you don't want them to be there So any thought that's an intrusive thought is like a persistent, negative, unwanted thought. And most of the time when people have them, they feel kind of disturbed by it. Like, whoa, why did I just think something so violent? Or why did I just think that really dark thought? Or like, I don't think I want to die. Why am I having suicidal thoughts? So no, it's not sinful when we have intrusive thoughts like that because you're not you're not causing that thought, you know. Our brain, like I said, can not work in a healthy way. And if you are having intrusive thoughts or suicidal thoughts, like that's a big red flag that your brain is not in a healthy place. If it's a one-time thing where it was really fleeting and you're like, oh, that was weird, um, that's one thing. But if you keep thinking about like, I would just rather not be here or life would be better without me or what's the point, like, I could really just end it. Like, that is not the way a healthy brain thinks. And so that's like, if you had a fever, yeah, people have fevers. It's pretty common, but don't shrug it off like it's, like it's nothing. If you have a fever, it's clearly your body telling you something is wrong. You're sick. And it's the same thing with a suicidal thought. It's like, it's God's way and your body's way of saying like, hey, something is not right here that needs to be addressed. And so is it a sin not to have the thought, but if you choose to feed it and dwell on it and act on it, like then you're getting into like, okay, now those things are leading me into sin, yeah. you know? That's really good. I think of the, the verse that says that we should take every thought captive, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, you had a thought. Okay, great. What are you going to do with it? So yeah. um, I'm going to kind of try to hit two more questions here really quick before we let everybody go. Um, Here's one I, I, that I thought was kind of just to pivot a little bit is this. When you're in middle school, a lot of times 
it's kind of the first phase of your life where you hit death and experience real grief. Right. And so one of the questions that we had come in from our middle school was, and what do you do and how do you deal with grief? It's a brain, if you've never experienced it before, um, what are, do you have any quick like action tips for how to process grief? Um, the best thing with grief, which is a grief is a trip. It's just, it's hard. Um, and grief is a journey. So it's like, if you're hoping that grief is just going to be like a one and done thing, it's not even years later, it can kind of like hit you like a wave and you're just wrecked again. You know, um, the best thing with grief is to actually think about it like waves, like you're standing on a beach and those heavy feelings of sadness or anger or despair or frustration at the situation or loneliness or whatever it is that you just let that wave come and wash over you. Like you just know it's okay to feel this way. It's because I loved that person so much that I'm hurting so much. And that love is not for nothing. Like that love is powerful. And so I'm just gonna like know that I don't like the way the pain feels, but I'm just gonna let it wash over me because I know it's not gonna last. And that's the nice thing about grief is it gives you breaths. You're not in it all the time, 24 seven. It's just when it hits you, it kind of knocks you over. Um, and sometimes grief can feel like nothing. Like you can just feel numb. Like you just feel like you're just existing, but you're not really like living life. It's like all the joy got sucked out and you're like, I don't even know who I am anymore. And so um, again, that's just another wave. It's not gonna last, but I would just encourage them to just not feel shame about feeling that. Um, trying to remember the things that you loved about that person and, and the goodness they brought to your life and know that this is not our home and we're gonna see them again. And so that, I guess the pain, it sucks, but it's because you love and love is so worth it, you know? That's really good. I like what you said too about just anger and numbness and like not feeling anything is all actually a, part is a it. normal part of the waves that roll in. And mm-hmm. so, no, that's really, really helpful. Um, last question I have for you is this, and this is a specific, there's some specific questions around this, but also just a, a general, like kind of your parting shot, if you will, at our middle schoolers is this, if you, for the students in the room right now who are just having, like you're here and you just question your self-worth, like, man, like, I just don't know. Like I wake up in the morning, not knowing, am I good enough? Am I going to perform well enough? Am I going to obey well enough? Mm-hmm. Like fill in the blank. Like, man, am I worth anything? Yeah. Um, what, would you, what would you say to that student? I would say I feel that way all the time. <laughs> Everybody feels that way sometimes. It's not uncommon, but man, it just is, it's, it's such a quick way to just not love life and not love yourself. And then we don't treat ourselves well when we don't think it's, we're worth it. So one thing I do is I do a trick called be your own best friend. And if I'm thinking a crappy thought about myself or am I feeling crappy about myself, I will literally think, would I say that to Renee? Would I say that to Leah? Would I say like, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter what you do, nobody cares about you. Or like say the joke or don't say it, nobody thinks you're funny. Like, I mean, if I did say that, I would be being kind of mean. But it's like, if it's not true of that person that I love, it's not true of me. And we need to start training ourselves to know like, I have to start seeing myself the way God sees me or I'm never gonna appreciate what he did on the cross. Like, he did it because he said, I'm worth it. If you have breath in your lungs right now, if you have a heart that's beating, like, God made you to be here because you matter and you're worth it. And he's gifted you and he wants you to use those gifts for his glory. And it's okay that you're in middle school and you don't know what those are yet. But, like, just wait. Like, he's doing something in you right now. He's doing something in you in the future. And we have to start being our own best friends because when we're our own worst enemy, you're the one person you can't get away from. You can get away from the bully at school. You can get away from your sister who annoys you. You cannot get away from yourself. And like, if you don't love yourself and treat yourself well, you're making yourself basically hang out with a bully all day. And like, I don't want to do that. (laughs) Yeah, that's incredible. Be your own best friend. Yeah. Would you say this thing that you're saying to yourself to the person that you're closest to? Be excessively kind Um, and gracious to yourself, even if it feels weird. I love that. I love it. Guys, you have paid incredible attention. Here's what I want to do. I want to wrap tonight with two, two things. First, we're going we're gonna to just take a moment. We're going to pray. And we're gonna, I want you guys in this moment, as, I, as I'm praying out loud, I want you to pray quietly for 
as well. And just so if you're next to somebody that you don't know, maybe don't do this, but if you're next to somebody that you're close to, maybe just lay your hand on the person around you. We're going to pray that God would make this a place where we are able to walk into this place and we are able to, with gentleness and grace and love, meet each other where we're at, speak truth in love. And guys, I believe that this is a place where mental and emotional healing can be real. And so that's what we're going to do first. And then when I'm done praying, here's what's going to happen, guys. I'm going to let, if you're ready to get up and go play and you're done, that's great. But if, man, if you're at a place where you're like, I need to have, I have another question that didn't get answered. I need to talk to somebody. I'm going to have the connection group leader stay here. And you guys will have an opportunity to hang back, have conversations with us, with your connection group leaders um, before you go home tonight. So guys, wrap your arms around somebody near you. Bow your, bow your heads, close your eyes. Jesus, we are so thankful for the truth that, God, we, we read scripture and it says that we are created in your image. God, it says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God, we declare those truths over every student in the room tonight, that they would see their worth in you and their value in you as created to image and to model you. And Jesus, at the same time, our hearts weep with the fact that sin has broken and distorted that image and that reality. And so, Jesus, we know that tonight there are students in this room who have been battling and fighting feelings of hopelessness, sadness, anxiety, depression. There's students even in this room that for them, the thoughts of suicide that keep creeping back. God, we are praying that the enemy would not get a foothold in our lives. Jesus, would you drive Satan Would you drive falsehood out of our minds and out of our hearts? And God, would you bring healing and hope to every student in this room tonight? Jesus, thank you for Jill and her words. And I just pray that that walking out of this place, God, that we would know you better and that, God, we would understand even our own hearts and our own minds a little bit better to be able to walk into our relationship with Jesus and our relationship with others as a healing, hope-filled presence. In your name we pray, amen.